So, uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for having me here. And it's my first time in Bulgaria, so it's fantastic weather and, you know, very nice city. So I will definitely be back. Uh, so my name is Julian, and I've got a t-shirt that says I'm the AWS guy. So probably that's what I am, right? So yeah, I'm a tech evangelist. I'm based in the Paris office. Um, and uh, sometimes, because uh, I travel a lot, uh, in May this month, I traveled to 10 different countries. So it's, it's kind of my own silly record. It's going to be hard to beat. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, backends. And since I believe this is the Java conference, uh, we're going to look at some Java code and uh, try to give you some information on um, what, what backends are available for, for data uh, storage and for uh, analytics and how you can use them um, with your Java apps, okay? So I'm going to show Java code, but you know, if you, if you do other languages too, uh, you know, what I'm going to say obviously applies because we have many different SDKs, not just Java. So we're going to start very quickly with a few, a few ideas, a few things on um, uh, how, to, uh, how you can write Java apps on AWS, what, what tools are available, uh, you know, some background information. Then quickly we're going to dive in uh, databases and we're going to talk specifically about RDS, our relational database service and DynamoDB, our uh, NoSQL database. And I've got some nice code to show you there. And we'll run it, of course. And then we'll talk about analytics, right? How do you, how do you crunch data? How do you uh, uh, process tons of, uh, tons of data on AWS? And we'll look at three different options. Hive on uh, Amazon Elastic MapReduce, which is our managed environment for Hadoop apps. Uh, Amazon Athena, and Amazon Redshift. And then we'll try to summarize everything, okay? And we'll have some time at the end for questions, uh, and I'll be around afterwards. Um, all the code that I'm going to show you and I'm going to run today is available on GitHub, and of course you will get the slides. I will share them on, on Twitter uh, this afternoon, okay? So let's start with Java, writing Java apps. So. Um, we have four deployment options on AWS. So uh, first I have to say, who, who's, uh, I have to ask, who's using AWS today? All right, quite a few people, okay. So you should know what the four options are, okay? So let's, nah, come on, I'll do it. So the first one is uh, Amazon EC2, right? Virtual machines, uh, starting, starting virtual servers, connecting to them and just managing them, okay? So it's, it is a virtual machine, and you can choose all different sizes and, 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 and shapes and, and configurations. But you know, it's, it's a fairly classic way of deploying code. The second way is to use uh, the ECS service, the EC2 container service, for Docker applications. So ECS allows you to run and, and, uh, and schedule uh, containers across uh, multiple Docker instances. Okay. So interesting uh, way of deploying if you need, uh, if you like Docker, if you run Docker. The third one is AWS Lambda and the so-called uh, serverless architecture. So with Lambda, you can do different languages, but specifically for today, uh, you can do uh, Java 8. And there, there are also a bunch of open source frameworks like uh, the serverless framework or Gordon or Apex, but there are a few more that make it easy for developers to, uh, to deploy Lambda functions, to build APIs in front of those Lambda functions, et cetera. So if you haven't looked at those, you know, take a look. They're very interesting. And the last option is to use Elastic Beanstalk, um, which is a, a platform as a service uh, option, where basically you just provide your code, your application code, and it gets deployed uh, in one command on a, on a pre-built environment, which could be multiple versions of Java, multiple versions of Topcat, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So you have all these options, and you can pick, uh, you can try all four, and you, you can select the one that fits your application best. Okay? Obviously, we have a Java SDK um, uh, that's been around for a long time, and uh, it supports versions 1.6 and up. And so using this SDK, you can call all the APIs of all services or all AWS services. And I'm going to show you some examples later on, okay? So this is, 
these are the basics, right? You can get that SDK, use it to manage the AWS services, and you can deploy in those four different environments. So when it comes to tooling, uh, we maintain um, an AWS plugin for Eclipse, uh, which obviously allows you to have you know, wizards and everything for, uh, for projects. But I, I think the more interesting part is actually that you can manage um, uh, quite a few of your AWS resources inside Eclipse. So I'm going to quickly show you that later on. So you can, you, know, you can look at your EC2 instances. You can look at your uh, uh, database instances just from your Eclipse tool, which I think is nice. So if you guys are using IntelliJ ID, um, AWS does not maintain any plugins, but I found uh, some third-party plugins. So there's one for Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, there's one for CloudFormation to deploy your uh, infrastructure as code. And there's one that is called the AWS Manager that's very similar to what we do for Eclipse, but unfortunately it's very old, it's not maintained, doesn't seem to be working with the latest uh, IntelliJ versions. So it's a shame. So you know, if anybody want to, wants to pick that up and, and upgrade it, you know, I think you will become a hero for uh, uh, Java developers on AWS. Um, the last thing I want to say is, is very important, and, and maybe you know, I'm, I'm stating the obvious, but you know, it doesn't hurt to, uh, to repeat this. <laughs> uh, it's about credentials. So please do not hard code credentials in your applications. OK, well, you're laughing, but let me explain. Please do not store them on EC2 instances. OK, so when I'm talking about credentials here, I'm talking about two things. I'm talking about AWS credentials, the access key and the secret key that allow you to access the AWS API. And then I would say your higher level credentials, like your MySQL login and password or, or you know, anything that is used to authenticate against uh, a service or, or your own app. Uh, it's very tempting to do this, of course, right? And because, as we all know, security will take care of it later, right? And later means never, as we all know. So you should try and get this right from the start, because we, as we all know, you'll never go and clean it. And eventually, your API keys or your your backend passwords will be on GitHub, right? And if that happens, it's quite likely that we will find out because we monitor that, and uh, and we will suspend your AWS account if you if we find your credentials publicly available on GitHub or any other uh, 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 source management uh, 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 SaaS solution. Okay, so and you will get a friendly email from AWS support saying hi. Uh, your account has been suspended because we found your credentials on GitHub. So, eh. so why don't you remove it? Why don't you rotate the keys? And why don't you prove your identity? And then uh, we'll resume your account. Okay? And it happens to everybody, right? It's so easy. So what you should do, yeah, so it will end in tears and, and frustrations and, and email exchanges with us. So save everybody the trouble, please, and do it right. So the right way is for AWS credentials to use roles, right, in IAM, which is our uh, uh, permission and uh, 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 yeah, a policy management framework. So you should, you should use roles, so you create IAM roles, you attach permission to those roles, and you attach the roles to your EC2 instances or your Lambda functions or et cetera, et cetera. And that will give you what the permission that you need to run, what you need to run, okay? For, and I, that's uh, what I'm gonna show you. And, and um, if you have other credentials, like again, you know, uh, MySQL passwords, uh, you can use a, a newer service, which is called the Systems Manager, and it has a module called the, param the Parameter Store, and the name is pretty obvious. You can create parameters in there, so logins and password and secrets, and they're encrypted automatically with uh, Amazon Key MS, Key Management Service. So it's fully safe, and then you can call an API to retrieve them, okay, securely. And again, this is what I'm going to do in my code. So please, 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 please do not put stuff, do not put secrets in your code or in config files or anything like that, right? They should be completely, you know, hidden and outside of the application uh, domain. All right, I warned you. <laughs> it's a friendly warning. So uh, this is... 
our reference architecture for backends. So, um, you know, data will come into your systems in many different sizes and shapes, okay? Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, our customers asked us to build different backends to, f to be able to adapt to all these different pieces of data. So, today I'm going to talk about RDS, our uh, uh, SQL uh, uh, database service. I'm going to talk about DynamoDB, and then for analytics, I'm going to talk about those three. Okay, but we have more, but there's only so much I can cover in 45 minutes. So uh, we also have an Elastic Cache service for you know Memcache and Redis. Uh, we have Elastic Search, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know it's not the full picture today, just a good part of the picture. So let's go and start with databases. So the first one is. I uh, would say the most obvious one, the one that everyone needs, right? Everybody needs a relational database in their application, I suppose. And so we have a service which is called RDS. It's a managed service that lets you create in just a few clicks or one API call, you can create uh, a database instance with different engines. We're going to talk about this. And, and it's all built in a few minutes and available to for you to work with, okay? So you don't have to go and start a server and install MySQL or Postgres or something else and, and, and take care of, you know, backups and take care of everything. So uh, there are a few, uh, a few things that we automate, like backups and, and uh, version upgrades. Uh, you can scale up and down, you can scale out, you can add read replicas, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so it takes away a lot of the, you know, plumbing that is involved with database servers. And it also takes away some maintenance operations. Um, uh, so even if you have a DBA in your team, you know, you can uh, spend his time doing more in interesting things than checking that the backup actually worked. So multiple engines are available. Uh, so for open source, we have MySQL, MariaDB, and Postgres. And for commercial databases, we have Oracle and SQL Server. And we have Aurora. I'll get back to Aurora in a second. So this is the slide that is never up to date, right? So last time I checked, which is probably two days ago, it, it was up to date, but if you look at all the version numbers today, maybe something changed, right? So don't blame me, <laughs> all right? Um, but for MySQL, we support something like 15 different versions. You know, it's, uh, uh, so you, you have really the choice of selecting either the very latest version or something a little more conservative. And the same goes for, for the other ones. And apart from this, right, when you create the, the, the apart from selecting the engine, you know, it's, it's always the same idea. We're going to start those instances, and in a few minutes, you know, you can connect and you can start working with them. So pretty convenient. So we have a ton of RGS customers, uh, because like I said, everyone needs um, a backend in their application, a relational backend. So maybe I can just pick one like Airbnb. I'm sure you're familiar with those guys. And they've been on uh, AWS literally from day one and using RDS from day one for pretty much all their uh, uh, database needs. And well, you know, they scaled pretty well, I believe. So, uh, so probably this, tells, uh, this says something about RDS uh, being able to scale even for crazy startups like this. And there are many more, right? If you have a Lamborghini, well, you'll be happy to know that Lamborghini is using RDS as well. I'm not sure what for, but okay, they are. I should find out. So what about Aurora that I mentioned? So Aurora is a high-performance implementation uh, of MySQL and now also Postgres uh, built by the AWS teams. So basically, we took MySQL and Postgres and we, we improved them and we made them five times to 10 times faster, right? And we have benchmarks to, to show that. Um, and we also made them, um, we also improved the uh, high availability. Uh, the failover times for Aurora are much better than one they would be for, uh, let's say, MySQL, standard MySQL. And we also improved uh, storage scalability. Uh, Aurora can scale up to 64 terabytes. I think you will agree that this should be more than enough for a relational database. It's even a crazy number, if you ask me. So you can scale storage independently uh, from the instance up to 64 terabytes, so pretty nice. So lots of improvements like that. So if you're a MySQL user and or Postgres user and you need something with a little more punch, 
uh, you might, you know, you might try Aurora. Uh, it's gonna, you know, it should help. Uh, and you don't need to go to commercial databases and pay for licenses. Just my own opinion. So let's take a look at RDS Aurora. So before I show you that, I need to show you a few, uh, very quickly a few things. So how am I connecting to all those backends? Well, I'm using JDBC drivers. And uh, so you've seen this a million times, right? And this is my connect function, and it is vanilla. Uh, <laughs> it's vanilla JDBC. There's nothing AWS specific here, right? So I just have two versions of this, because in some cases, I'm using AWS credentials to connect. So no login and password. And in some other cases, I do need a login and a password, so that's it. But apart from that, you know, it's, it's really, it's JDBC driver manager. You know, you, you've done this, you can do this in your sleep, okay? Uh, the more interesting thing is how do I get credentials? So for example, for MySQL and Aurora, I will need to get the login and password for Aurora. And this is what I just told you a few minutes ago. This is the, the system, manager, uh, system manager from EC2. So I just build a client, I build a request with a credential name, which is a you know, predefined name that I gave that credential. I ask for that credential to be decrypted, and then I just get that parameter and return it. Okay. So it's safely stored in, in that parameter store uh, module, and I, just, I can just retrieve it like that, so that I never have to store it either in the code or in the config file. Um, what about the queries on the data set? So I'm using a data set with fake uh, uh, e-commerce transactions. I did not get some Amazon.com data, sorry. Uh, that would be my last talk ever. Uh, so it's, it's stuff that I generated. So it's one table with one billion lines, you know, and last name, first name, and state, and, and, and uh, amount, etc. So, you know, I'm just running the same statement all the time, the same query I'm getting. Um, I'm getting the first name and last name and age of uh, all people with a certain name in a certain state. And again, I'm using prepared statements. This is vanilla JDBC, right? Nothing special here. There will be one exception I will show you later on, okay? So that's this function you will see, find by last name and state. Okay, so let's look at Aurora. So I'm using the MySQL driver, right? Because Aurora is compatible with this. That's my endpoint, so I created my instance um, uh, before the demo. I'm grabbing my credentials here, right? Like I showed you, so it's, this is the safe way to do it. I'm connecting, and then I'm calling one AWS API to uh, describe that instance, right? So part of the Java SDK to learn some stuff about my database instance. And then I'm running that query. I'm trying to find all the people called Jones in Florida, okay? Okay, so let's, let's try this. Okay, so I got my credentials. Uh, my server is called Julian, that's not really original. That's the instance size, and these are the rows. So 226 rows, 226 people called Jones in Florida. So what did I do here? I, I called a query on one billion lines, one table, and that was pretty fast, right? So that was pretty fast because I have the right indexes, obviously. So I've got an index on last names, and I've got an index on states. So the message here is uh, don't rush, uh, don't, don't, don't throw relational stuff uh, to the garbage because you think NoSQL is always faster, right? It's a, it's a mistake some people make sometimes. Relational databases can be really, really fast if you know what the queries are going to be and if you can optimize for these queries. So obviously here, if I run, let's say, if I, if I run a count on that table, if I do a full scan, it's going to take ten, about 10 minutes, right? So that's not very efficient because there's no way I can index for that. But if you have predefined queries and you can optimize for that, you can make SQL very, very fast and RDS very, very fast, especially with Aurora, okay? So keep that in mind. You know, it's not just about NoSQL and stuff, okay? So as you can see, there's hardly anything specific to AWS here. Um, the connect call is vanilla JDBC. The state, the query is vanilla JDBC. Uh, so it's very easy to switch from 
uh, your uh, on-premise or uh, MySQL or Postgres or Oracle to RDS, right? It, it will be fully compatible with what you already know, and you you need minimum changes to your code. Okay, so let's move on. Let's talk about DynamoDB. So sometimes you do need NoSQL, right? Sometimes uh, you you want to do key value stuff or. You don't, want, you don't need transactions, you can live with eventual consistency, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and maybe the, just the volume of data that you need to read and write is just too much for, uh, for a, uh, a standard SQL database. And so that's what DynamoDB is for. It's fully managed, even more than RDS. Here, you don't even have to create instances. You just create tables and put and get items in there. It's, uh, you know, it's as easy as it gets, usually uh, developers I uh, really like DynamoDB because it's very friendly. There's really no infrastructure to deal with. Uh, so you can do uh, key values stuff. Um, well, that's what we call the low-level API, put and get. Or you can do uh, high, you can work with the high-level API. In, um, so I, I don't want to call it uh, ORM because there's no relation. <laughs> so there's no R. But it's similar to an ORM. I'm going to show you this. And you can scale it uh, pretty easily as well. Uh, just say how much read capacity, how much write capacity you need, and it will scale. Okay. So it's it's very popular for people who have tons of data, like Expedia. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with them, and they use DynamoDB for real-time analytics. Uh, and so they they put in DynamoDB, you know, tons of events, actually over 200 million events, uh, coming from their websites every day, and then. They, they have uh, an, uh, real-time analytics implementing on, implemented on top of that data. So, you know, DynamoDB will scale really, really, really high. If you need to go to, you know, hundreds of thousands of reads per second, right? Well, you can use that. You can do that in DynamoDB. Right? It's more difficult for uh, for us as a relational database. So let's look at uh, Dynamo. So first, we're going to look at the high level, uh, the low level API. I'm going to scare you with that a little bit, and then uh, we'll look at the high level, and, and you will say, oh, okay, that's, that's easier. Okay, so, so here's, my, uh, here's my main function. So, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Actually, you can download uh, DynamoDB from us and run it locally on your machine. So it's really, really cool for development and testing. You don't have to connect to a, to a AWS to work with it. So you can work locally and then uh, just change the connection like I'm doing here and connect to the, the, actual, the actual service, okay? Okay, so here, what am I doing? I'm connecting to DynamoDB in the US and I'm creating a movie table and I'm uh, printing that descri the description for that table and I'm, I'm adding some movies and then uh, playing with the API. Okay, so let's take a quick look at Table creation. Okay, so so yeah, yeah, it's this one is a little more complicated because we need to give you know we need to define attributes. I know it's not SQL. So um, this table will have three attributes that I'm going to use for keys and um, and uh, so uh, hash keys and range keys. So uh, title, rating, release date. Um, so my hash key will be, uh, it will be the title, and I have a, another index, what we call a secondary index for ratings and uh, release dates, okay? And the actual creation of the table is this, okay? So create a table, give the name, uh, specify what the, sh the hash key is, so the sharding key to shard the items across the different DynamoDB nodes. Uh, what are the other attributes? Uh, what's the in? If there is an index, what is the index? And then how much capacity do I need to provision for read and writes? Okay, so that's creating the table, and then I can just add. So I'm adding some Star Wars movies to that table. And uh, how do you do that? Well, it's fairly easy, right? Just build an item, give the primary key for that item, and just call this, right? It's no SQL, so it's always going to be put and get, right? So this is how you store an item in the table, okay? Uh, and then you can call get item to get, to get an item with the key, et cetera, et cetera. 
Okay, so let's run this example. So, and I don't think the table exists. So yeah, this is maybe a little too small down there, but I can't make it bigger. Uh, so here you see the manager uh, plugin for uh, AWS. And so we'll see uh, when the table is created, it's gonna show up in here. So let's run this. So I'm creating the table with that API call I showed you. It's, it's taking maybe 10 seconds um, to, to, provision, uh, to provision everything inside DynamoDB. And then we're going to run all those calls. So hide all the movies, get a movie with the get item API. Uh, I can do batch get item. I can get multiple items from multiple tables if I want. I can update an item. I can query items. Uh, and if, because I have got indexes and, 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 uh, and hash keys. And if you don't, if you want to query, if you want to look for items on something that is not a key, for example here, I want to do, uh, I want to find all the movies in the Star Wars series, and I don't have any key or index for that, then I need to call the scan operation, which is exactly what the name means, it's scanning the table. So it's much slower than querying, so we don't really recommend it for very large tables, but you know, you, you still have that option. And of course we can delete items. Okay, so, looks like it worked. I did my movies, uh, got my movies, so let's look at maybe uh, the get, this one here. Okay, how do you get an item? Well, just like this. You know, it's, it's what you would expect. <laughs> get an item from a key and that's it. Um, let's look at maybe uh, one of the queries. Um, yeah, for example, this one here. Trying to find all the movies with a given rating and a given between a start year and end year. So I'm building my query here. So we have a, a query language saying, okay, rating must be equal to a parameter and release date must be between start and end. And you know, I've got those placeholder uh, variables here that I'm actually assigning to my parameters and then I'm running my query, okay? So you know, it, it's, it's not really, really complicated. It's, it's really different from, from SQL, that's for sure. But you know, um, in this example, you will find, uh, you know, you will find examples for, uh, for most of the, I would say most of the low level API. Okay, so you can just grab that code and, and tweak it and see how you do updates and how you do deletes, et cetera, okay? So that's the low level API and, and yeah, it is really low level. So what about objects? So now let's say I've got movies, I, you know, I, I wanna see movies like objects, not keys and values and stuff. So of course I'm going to define a table, call, uh, sorry, a class, call that DynamoDB and with my attributes, okay? and getters and setters and constructors, you know, very totally standard stuff here, okay? And the only thing I have to do here is to uh, use annotations to uh, say first, this stuff is going to be stored in, the, in that table. And this is the hash key here, title. And this is the hash key for the for the rating uh, index, and this is the range key for the release, for the rating index. Okay, so just a couple of notations to say, okay, these attributes are actually keys in that table, okay? So, and it's a POJO, like, you, you know, there's really no, uh, I'm not extending or uh, in, um, in implementing anything here. So how do I use that? Well, this time, so I'm using the I-level API, which is uh, called the DynamoDB mapper object. And again, you know, so I'm using the same table that I created just minutes ago. So you can, you can mix, you can work with the low level and the high level API on the same tables. It's not gonna, as long as your definitions are consistent, it's not gonna break, okay? So here I'm, I'm adding a movie to the table, okay? And how do I do that? Uh, where is it? Oh, here it is, okay. And it's what you would expect, right? I, I create a new DynamoDB movie object from all those uh, parameters, and I just call mapper.save, right? And that writes my object into the table, okay? And how do I get that object back? Well, pretty much what you would expect, okay? I create, 
um, an empty uh, uh, an empty object, right? And I ask the mapper to find the one that has this uh, hash key for it. Okay. So you know it's really you know load and save objects in one call and no no drama. Okay. And if I want to query, I can query as well. So here I want to query for movies with a specific rating. So I'm creating an object. I'm assigning the rating attribute to the value I want to look for. And then I'm building that query expression, saying, OK, this is the hash key that you should be looking for. OK? And I can use the rating as a hash key because I have an index on the, on the ratings, remember? And then I just run the query. And I get a movie list, a list of objects that I can just iterate through and print. Okay. So it's a higher, obviously, a higher level way of doing things. Uh, so if you want to load and save POJOs into DynamoDB, this is how you do it. Okay, and it's it's friendlier than the low-level interface. I agree. But some people use DynamoDB for stuff that are obviously not objects, right? Just strictly key-value store, and then it makes more sense to use the low-level API. So let's run this. See if it works on our table. Looks like it did. So I added the movie. I got it again, right? Loaded it again from the table. And then I run my query to find all the five star movies in my table. Okay? So as you can see, you know, if you if you know SQL could be either very low level uh, for you know very, very granular, very unstructured data with a low level API, uh, at the cost of some complexity. Or if you're, if you're looking for an ORM-like behavior, but okay, keep in mind there is no R because there is no relation here, uh, but it's an ORM-like behavior, then you can use the DynamoDB mapper and, and work with your POJOs. And you know, it's, again, uh, you don't need a lot of code to, uh, to integrate that in your app. And you never worry about you know, scaling and, uh, and high availability and fixing database clusters and everything like that. Like that. Okay. So, as a summary for um, for the databases, so uh, I added some more information on uh, Elastic Cache and uh, and Elastic Search and some other services because they're also useful if you need to store, uh, you know, some different types of data. Um, and you know, I, we're not going to go through all this, but you can read it. And you know, if you have questions, you can. Uh, you can contact me later on. I'm always happy to answer questions. But as you can see, when it comes to DynamoDB and, R and RDS, the main difference, obviously, is do you have st are you using structured data? Do you have a schema? In which case, you know, RDS makes a lot of sense, if, especially if you need transactions. Or if you don't need transactions or, and your data is not really well-defined or you want to work with objects, right? Uh, then uh, DynamoDB makes more sense. And DynamoDB generally will scale much higher than RDS. Okay. Again, if you need to go through crazy read, write, read per second or write per second, and I'm, when I say crazy, I'm saying you know, like a million per second, you can do it on DynamoDB. It's going to be more difficult on RDS, even with Aurora. Okay, so let's move on to uh, analytics. So the first one that I want to talk about is um, Hive. Uh, it's still a popular choice. So um, we have this EMR service that's been available for since 2009, I believe. And it's the managed environment for all the Hadoop uh, ecosystem. So it started with Hadoop and Hive, and then we added Spark and, and Impala and Presto and Flink and all those weird animals. And, but the, the principle is always the same. Um, it's a managed service, so in, one, in a few clicks or one API call, you create your Hadoop cluster. Uh, you wait for, let's say, 10 minutes for the, 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 the cluster to be ready. All those tools are pre-installed, and then you can just connect and start working. Okay? And you can add nodes and remove nodes, and you can scale it fairly easily. Um, so this is a popular service, obviously. I just want to give you one example. It's this uh, company called FINRA. Uh, it's, uh, it's a regulation agency in the US. So it's, what they do is complicated, so I'll try to keep it very simple. So basically, they, they, they look at all the trades done on the US markets, right? So every single trade done on the US market 
is, is logged by FINRA during the day. And then, once the market is closed in the afternoon and at night, they run very complicated machine learning jobs to figure out if something is not quite right in the market. Right? So they're looking for suspicious trades, illegal trades, uh, you know, and if they find something, then they have to report it to the SEC for investigation, etc. So it's pretty serious stuff, and it's it's crazy uh, volume, right? It's 35 billion uh, items to ingest and process every day, and so they do that with EMR and and Hive and so on, and they run up to 10,000 nodes, right? Think about that, 10,000 nodes to do this. Um, but the thing is, you know, during the day, they don't really need those nodes, right? They really need those nodes at night when, you know, when they can run the analysis. So it would be silly for them, or at least inefficient, uh, to buy 10,000 nodes that are, don't do much during the day and, and then, you know, get maybe saturated at night, okay? So the elasticity that, uh, that we give them is, is very important because during the day, they can, you know, terminate all the clusters or scale them down to you know, minimal capacity and then at night they can just you know, go full, uh, they can go crazy and start you know, 10,000, 11,000, 12,000 <laughs> if they need that, you know, there's always more. Um, and, and they pay, you know, obviously they make a large savings and they, they said that they save about uh, 20 million dollars every year in infrastructure with it, thanks to AWS compared to what they were doing before. 20 million bucks, serious money. So that's an example. So we have smaller customers, but I like this one because, you know, 10,000 nodes, that's pretty bad. All right, let's look at Hive. So Hive is Hive. So let me start with running it because it's going to take some time. All right. Yeah. Oh, no, this is DynamoDB again. And... Yeah, it's slow, so it must be Hive. All right. Okay, so uh, here I've got, uh, I created a Hadoop cluster with 10 nodes, 10 rather large nodes, <laughs> right? Uh, C4 to Excel instances, if you know what that means. Pretty large instances. Um, and, uh, and it's always the same data set that I'm, that I'm working with. Um, and so it's running. So here I'm describing the cluster, okay? So... Same as before, describing the cluster, or here, sorry, describing the cluster and running my query here. And it's taking a while, right? Because it's Hive. Right? So if you, use, if you use Hadoop or Hive, you know that. They kind of say, well, you know, we kind of guarantee the job is going to run completely if, if it's not buggy. Uh, but we can't really make any you know, promise on how fast it's going to run because we don't know what the cluster is doing at any given time and, and you know, MapReduce could be taking some time. So, oh, here it is, okay. So it took about a minute and it's still 226 rows, okay. So, you know, these days it looks like I spend a lot of time uh, <laughs> saying bad things about Hive, so, you know, it's, it's gonna come back at me at some point. But the message is, um, for me, you know, I, I use Hadoop and Hive in previous jobs. And uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that, you know, it goes back to 2009, 2010, and we're in, you know, 2017, right? So technology has changed, and there's definitely faster stuff out there than Hive. So if, you, if you're still running, you know, uh, let's say SQL-like stuff or, or uh, you know, analytics on Hive, uh, well, you know, it's probably time to look for something a little faster because there definitely are some options, okay? So apart from that, you know, it's, it's great. I mean, Hadoop did great, but um, I think it's time for something else, okay? So what that something else could be, for example, is Athena. So Athena is a new service that we launched in December, and it's based on... Uh, it's based on uh, an open source service called, uh, an open source uh, project called Presto. And what you can do with Athena is you can run SQL queries, standard SQL queries, on data hosted in S3. So just leave the data in S3 and query it directly. Okay? So you don't have to load anything, you don't have to index anything, you just 
basically create a table, an external table, that with a schema that corresponds to the data in S3. Okay, so that's just one create table statement. It takes less than one second, and you can query. And you really have nothing to do, right? You don't need to create anything. You don't need to scale anything. You know, perfect. Zero, zero work. Um, so it's based on Presto, and for all the querying part, it's standard SQL, right? So what Presto supports, with a very few exceptions, is going to be supported on Athena. And the cool thing about Athena is, since the data is in S3, it's able to support multiple different formats, like unstructured data or semi-structured, CSV, TSV, etc., JSON, or structured formats, like the columnar formats, Parquet, ORC, and uh, the serialized format, Avro. S and, and it can handle compressed data and partition data. So that means if your data is looking like this in S3, then Athena can query directly. You don't need to go through ETL or transformations or, you know, just, okay, it's in S3, it's in this bucket, query it. Okay, I'm gonna show this. Uh, here's an example of a customer who works with this. It's, a, it's an ad tech company called DataXoo in the US, and if you know a little bit about that tech, you know it usually means crazy volumes because they do real-time bidding and they get billions and billions of, uh, of display requests every day. And they funnel this through uh, a number of our services, like Kinesis, and everything ends up in S3. And from S3, uh, well, they can do uh, visualization with their tools, or they can, do, uh, they can query it with Athena, right? If they want to investigate some performance issues, or, or just, you know, investigate, explore the data very fast without the need to create any infrastructure, they can do that on Athena. And they're handling 180 terabytes of log data, new log data every day. So you can imagine the volumes. It's, it's uh, very large. So let's look at Athena. So Athena is a little bit different. So I'm still connecting with JDBC, as you can see here. And I'm using my uh, local credentials just to show you a different way to do this, but that's not really important. So I'm connecting here, but, and I'm still running the same query, but unfortunately, um, we have no prepared statement at the moment available on Athena, and that's because of Presto doesn't have it, okay? And they're actively working on this issue. <laughs> I keep checking that thing every, every week, and there's definitely you know, progress. So I'm, you know, I'm guessing we will fix that problem pretty soon, but for now, I don't have prepared statements, so I have to use normal statements, you know, which isn't perfect. It gets the job done, but of course, from a security point of view, it's not as good. And obviously, I need to add some quotes everywhere and blah, blah, blah. But okay, just a minor, a minor problem that's hopefully going to be fixed pretty soon. So let's run this. And again, the only thing that I did here, I've got my data set in S3. One, one billion lines, always the same thing. I just created a table that says, okay, that's the name, and that's the last name, and that's the state, etc. cetera. And, and that's it, so let's run it. So here I'm listing some of the uh, latest queries. That's an example of APIs, yeah. And, yeah, come on. And here I go, right? I've got my 226 rows. And it took, it took about f seven or eight seconds. We see the time here, actually, <laughs> because I keep running that thing. Yeah, it takes eight seconds, okay? So this means, you know, if you have that question in your head and you think your S3 data can answer it, you have to create a table that maps to that data. Maybe you already have that table created because you've worked with that data already. And you can just go and ask the question and get the answer in seconds. And there's no infrastructure to manage, no infrastructure to provision, no infrastructure to scale, and no infrastructure to pay for. Because you only pay for the queries that you run. So when you're not querying, you're not paying anything on Athena, which I think is cool compared to, let's say, RDS or EMR, where you have to pay for the instances that are active and, and running. So from a cost point of view, Athena is super competitive. Yeah? It's good to remember that. And uh, the last one. is called Redshift. So Redshift is a relational data warehouse. 
Uh, it's, uh, it's been out for a few years now. Uh, it's, it's based on, uh, uh, it's compatible with the Postgres uh, SQL. So if you know SQL, that's, that's fine. That's all you need to know. You don't need to learn any new language to work with Redshift. Again, it's a managed service, so you just create the cluster, wait for a few minutes, and you can start loading and, and querying data. It's massively parallel. You can, you can have clusters over 100 nodes and uh, uh, capable of storing you know, more than one petabyte, actually, you know, multi-petabyte data. So it will scale. You can start with just two or three nodes, four nodes, and, and you know, grow the cluster as you need. Um, you know, to have more compute capacity and more data storage. And it's very, again, on, it's very competitive. Uh, you can get as low as $1,000 per terabyte per year, which is, which is quite competitive if you compare it to other solutions, which I will not name because I'm such a friendly guy. But you know who they are. And recently, um, actually, we added uh, Athena-like capabilities to Redshift. Uh, just two months ago, with an, uh, an extension of Redshift called Spectrum. So let me explain the architecture just for a second. So Redshift, is, like I said, is a cluster architecture. So you send your queries to the leader node. It, it optimizes it, builds the execution plan, breaks the query into sub-queries for the different nodes of the cluster, and they all work in parallel on their data and send the data back to the, the results back to the leader node. And, uh, and actually, Spectrum is outside of Redshift. It's a fleet of managed nodes, managed infrastructure that we take care of. And um, basically, it does the same thing as Athena. Uh, so you could have data in S3, and you could query it from Redshift. Okay? You could join it with data that is hosted on the Redshift cluster. So you could have local data on the Redshift cluster and external data in S3 and do joins, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like the best of both worlds. You can have local data, very you know, smaller data set, highly optimized for you know, real-time reporting, et cetera, et cetera. And you could have petabytes of historical data in S3 that sometimes you, know, you need to query or you need to join with the, the, the local stuff. So it's like the best of both worlds. And generally, Redshift is, is really, really fast if you optimize it well. A lot of people moved from Hive to Redshift uh, time, some time ago. And a lot of those guys said, well, it's 20 to 50 times faster than Hive. Right? So uh, they were really happy about that. And this is even before Spectrum. Right? Now with Spectrum, it's, uh, it's even faster. Okay, so uh, if you need uh, the best performance possible, Right? because you want to do real-time dashboards and that kind of thing, then Redshift is going to be the fastest, always. Right? Um, um, and, and, and now you get also the benefits of having that external data. Okay? So let's look at Redshift. So I've got a JDBC driver for it. I've got an endpoint. Uh, I've got credentials. So once again, I need to get them safely. Uh, I'm describing my cluster with the describe cluster API, right? And then I'm still finding those Joneses in Florida, right? Um, I'm obsessed with the Joneses in Florida, it seems. Hmm, what does that mean? Okay, and see, it's really simple. And as you can see, it's, you know, some, somebody should raise their hand and say, come on, you pr except for DynamoDB, this is the same code four times. You're really lazy. And Absolutely, right? And uh, I think this is good because this means you can switch from, you can take that code and switch it from one backend to the other by m maybe changing the JDBC driver and that's about it, right? It's always the same SQL stuff. It's always pretty much the same connection stuff. So if you want to move from one to the other, you know, it's very easy, right? You, you, you don't even have to understand that it's an AWS backend. I could just give you that connection chain and say, hey, that's Postgres, or that's MySQL, and you, know, you wouldn't know, right? You wouldn't know if it's local or remote. And that's good, because you don't need to, you know, you don't need to disrupt your application code just because now you're using cloud services. It should be friendly to your code. OK, so let's run Redshift. So credentials, Redshift description, boom. All right, so here in this case, I'm using Spectrum. So actually, 
I'm using this, its S3 data um, just like uh, the exactly, in exactly the same configuration as for um, Athena, right? So Athena was about seven seconds, eight seconds. Well, this was faster, right? <laughs> Let's do it again. Okay. Okay, credentials. Oh, and now it's going to be slow just to make me look silly. <laughs> okay, well, it, oh no, here it goes. But yeah, so that last, you know, the last query is less than one second, maybe two seconds at most. So that's Spectrum, and it, so you see, even there, you can see Spectrum is, is blazingly fast, okay? So again, if you're looking for speed, 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 it's gonna be a redshift uh, you know, that you should look for, okay? All right, time to, uh, time to close. So some more information on the back ends. Again, you know, I'm not gonna read this, but it's a recap of everything I said, hopefully, uh, just to help you select the right one. Um, so this is what we looked at. Uh, just again, keep in mind, we have some other options for Elastic Cache, Elastic Search, et cetera. And the last thing I wanna say is, um, what about migration? So uh, we have two tools to help you migrate uh, between different databases. So it could be from on-premise databases to AWS, or it could be inside of AWS if you want to migrate from you know, uh, Oracle, RDS Oracle to RDS uh, Aurora, for example. Uh, it, it works too. So it's not just bringing your data inside AWS, it's also you know, moving it across the databases. So we have a tool called the conversion tool that's going to look at the schema and try to convert. So you say, okay, I want to go from Oracle to Postgres or Oracle to something else. And it's gonna look at the schema, try to convert as many objects as possible automatically, and it, whatever it cannot do automatically, it's gonna highlight it and say, well, you should, this should be done manually, and here are some hints on how to do it. And the database migration service will actually do the migration. So you, post, you point it at the source database. Again, it could be inside of AWS or outside of AWS and you point it to the destination, which could be inside of AWS or outside of AWS with uh, heterogeneous databases, and it's going to do replication and, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 as you go and as you update the table, it's gonna send in, a, in a real time those updates to the destination, okay? So pretty cool options if you wanna help migration. So as a conclusion, well, uh, as you can see, if you're a Java developer, there's, or if you're a developer in general, there's plenty of options. Um, you can, well, we hope that you can find everything that you need when it comes to backends, uh, you know, relational, NoSQL, analytics, Hadoop, something else. Um, you know, we have lots of options there, and I don't think we're stopping. Um, m all of these services are managed. Some of them are very highly managed, like DynamoDB, right, or Athena. So there's really as little infrastructure drama as needed, okay, and you can focus on uh, actually building your app uh, and let us take care of high availability and scalability and security, right? Just work on your product. Uh, just make your business efficient and leave the infrastructure plumbing to us, okay? Well, that's what I wanted to tell you today. Uh, thank you very much. Um, here's my email address if you have uh, questions later on. Feel free to shoot me an email. You can follow me on Twitter. Again, I will post the slides uh, later today. And again, thank you very much uh, to Jay Prime for having me today. And I'll be around, so if you have questions, we can talk. Thank you.